Hi, Steve here, blessedhopeforever.com. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. Psalm 115.3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. Job 42.2, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Daniel 2.21, And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Psalm 135.6, Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and all deep places. Acts 17.26, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. Proverbs 16.33, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Okay, now, it's hot out here. The event, though it's, it's just normal to, to us normal people, it's directed and de determined by God's counsel and providence. Man's decisions are not left to blind chance or to the influence of the stars or to uh, any invisible created being, angel or devil, but to the Lord only. There is no such thing as chance or events by chance. We don't worship a God of chance. They are all disposed. They are all ordered, governed by the sovereign will of God especially when it comes to Israel becoming a nation again, May 14, 1948. I don't know who would argue against that. I really don't. Following the Second World War and the Holocaust, international pressure mounted for the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, leading to the creation of the State of Israel. November 29, 1947. We're coming up on the 77th year anniversary of that. Of that historic partition of Palestine. And this year, it's Hanukkah, day one. 77 years. Okay? The 2017 sign eclipse marks 70 years since 1947. We're at the 77-year mark. It was on that date the General Assembly voted to partition Palestine into a Jewish and Arab state, states. Uh, all right. November 28, 29 is Hanukkah. And since the count didn't begin until the day following, this marks 77 years exact. I think it's a, a date worthy of paying attention to. It celebrates the rededication of the temple, Hanukkah does. It means dedication, the word Hanukkah. The rededication of the temple in Jerusalem in the second century BC that was liberated from occupying foreign forces. I think a rapture on that date would represent the church, the true temple, being liberated from foreign occupiers. The church is the one and only true temple of God at this present time on earth. We're it, the church. Now, Thanksgiving in 2024 is on November 28. Only in 2024 does U.S. Thanksgiving Day land on November 28. And nothing could make the Jews more jealous than for the rapture to occur on that date. Hanukkah is the Hebrew word for dedication. It's also known as the Festival of Lights. Many of you know it's an eight-day Jewish holiday celebrating the rededication of the temple in Jerusalem that happened in the second century B.C. It's usually observed in November or December. There's history behind Hanukkah. It's tied to a time when Israel was struggling for its existence. Hello. Okay, it's... I see that happening again today. In 167 BC, Israel was under the rule 
of Antiochus Epiphanes, who was known for his cruelty and his delusions of deity. His enemies mockingly referred to him as madman. And among many of the atrocities that he committed, he desecrated the temple in Jerusalem, dedicating it to Greek gods, his gods, other gods, and even sacrificing a pig on the altar. Now, what does that remind you of? Well, it reminds me of the midpoint of the tribulation period, the abomination of desolation. Okay? So there was a revolt that was led against Antiochus, led by the Maccabees, a Jewish family of priests. And after winning their freedom, the Jewish people rededicated the temple of God. I think that we will be presented to, the church will be presented, the temple to God and dedicated to God. According to tradition, when it was rededicated, there was only enough pure olive oil to light the temple menorah for one day. And as the story goes, the oil miraculously lasted eight days, long enough to to purify more oil. Now today, in remembrance of God's provision, the Jewish people light the eight candles on the nine candle menorah. The ninth candle is used to light the others. A new candle is lit on each night of Hanukkah, one candle for each day that the oil burned. Now at the midpoint in the tribulation period, the wise virgins, they have oil in their lamps. Why? Because they are eagerly awaiting the Messiah. You have to read that verse in context. It doesn't have anything to do with the church. Hanukkah is a testament to God's faithfulness to the Jewish people by preserving them through war and persecution and His faithfulness in fulfilling His promises to produce the Messiah from the line of David. I can't think of a, a better date for the rapture. For believers in Christ, it reminds us of several things. Uh, one, it's a sobering reminder of the force, of the strength of anti-Semitism, the hatred of the, of the Jewish people in the world. As believers, we ought to emulate God's love and concern for His chosen people by standing against anti-Semitism. And as if you've been keeping up with the news, you know there's been a sharp rise in that. It also reminds us of God's faithfulness, past, present, and future, to His church. Similar to Jewish history, church history has been marked by periods of intense persecution. Yet God has continued to bless and preserve the church since its birth. Kislev, the month of Kislev, 25, 25th day of Kislev, 164 B.C. That was when this occurred, the first Hanukkah. Now on your second, your secular calendar this year, it's actually Christmas, December 25th. So take your pick, November 29 or December 25. But November 29, I believe, is a noteworthy date and it could have, it could have prophetic implications. Almost 77 years ago, following the recommendation of a decisive majority of the 11 member UN Special Committee on Palestine, the UN General Assembly met to, to consider Resolution 181. The measure called for the creation of independent Arab and Jewish states in the land west of the Jordan River which for decades had been governed by Great Britain under a mandate. First from the League of Nations and then the United Nations. The final vote on that vote, which was extremely prophetic and, and important, was 33 countries in favor. 33. I want to put that number up here. It's not going away, okay? 13 against, 10 abstentions. How each UN member state at the time voted. You can look that up and you can read that online. I won't bother to go through that. There were those who were in support of this resolution. They voted. There were 33 countries 
33. And I believe God works in numbers. I believe He deals in numbers. I, many of my, the followers of this channel also believe that as well. I also believe God is supremely sovereign. If He wanted it to be 32, it would have been. If He wanted it to be 34, it would have been. If He wanted it to be all nations in favor, it would have been. Why were there only 33 nations in favor? And why has no one ever stopped to think that maybe that 33 has some kind of significance? I'm going to tell you this. It only has significance if you believe God is supremely sovereign. If you think that we worship a God of chance, then that, that number means nothing to you. Just ignore it. All right? All right? Now, the Arab nations, they categorically rejected the resolution. They denied any Jewish link to the land that was in fact associated with the Jewish people for thousands and thousands of years. And they declared that they would not be bound by its terms. They chose to go to war with the goal of seizing all the land and preventing a Jewish state from coming into being. And despite the fact that they had larger populations, larger territories, larger land mass, and they continue to try to do that, and they continue to fail to destroy the 33 vote, is what I'm going to say. All right? All right, the number 33. So I, I want to talk to you a little bit about 33. The English phrase 30 and 3, or uh, and 3 and 30, used for the number 33, appears seven times in, in, the, in seven King James Bible verses. It's mostly found in the Old Testament. They're found in uh, the most in First Chronicles. They're also it's also seen in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Samuel, and First Kings. Now, the meaning of the number 33 is connected to certain promises made by God. The 33rd time Noah's name is used in Scripture is when God makes a special covenant or promise with him. You all know the story. Our eternal God promised not to destroy the entire, entire world again with a flood, and He seals His pledge with the sign of the rainbow. That's Genesis chapter 9. Almost every Bible student knows that. Okay? Is familiar with that passage, or familiar with that verse, or they learned it in Sunday Bible, Sunday school, uh, Sunday school, when they were a child. Noah and the flood. I mean, it's... Okay? Alright. But that's not the end of the number 33 as we see it in Scripture. 33 is the, the, the numeric resp representation of the Star of David. Believe it or not. You know, the symbol. I'll, I'll put it up here so you can see it. It's seen in places s such as on their flag, uh, in, their, in their cemeteries, uh, to denote a Jewish burial. The Star of David. 33 also derives some of its meaning from the total number of times that the word three or the word third is used in the book of Revelation. It, it can represent, because it's the product of three times eleven, which by the way, eleven is judgment, means represents judgment. So, Revelation itself illustrates God's complete final judgment of the world, which is ultimately carried out in the final three and a half years, 1260 day period, leading up to the second coming of Christ. And 33 nations voted in approval. The divine name of God, Elohim, Strong's Hebrew 430, is initially mentioned in the first verse of Genesis, Elohim appears 33 times in the Genesis story of creation. And 33 nations voted. 33 is also the numeric equivalent of the word Amen, which means let it be so, and 33 nations voted yes. The 33rd time Abraham's name is used in the Bible is when Isaac, the child of promise, is born to him 
when he's 99 years old and 33 countries voted yes to UN resolution, resolution 181. The 33rd time Jacob's name is found in scripture, he promised to give a tenth of all he had to God when he had a vision of a ladder reaching to heaven. This is commonly referred to as Jacob's ladder. And 33, 33 nations voted in favor of that resolution. David became king in 1050 BC after the death of Saul. He ruled as king. Jerusalem, the city, now known as the city of David, became his capital during the remaining 33 years. 33 years of his rule. The 33rd person in Jesus' lineage from Adam is King David. And 33 nations said yes. 33 is equal to 3 times 11, both of which are prime numbers. Okay? And 33 countries voted in favor of that partition. November 29, 1947, which this year will make 77 years. Okay, back in 2017, it was 70 years since 1947. We've somehow managed to come to 2024 uh, by the will of our Lord. The year 2024, the year of our Lord, 2024, and we're at, 70, at the 77 year mark of this resolution, this vote, in which God, as you, if you paid attention to the verses I quoted at the beginning of the video, God had complete control over, absolute, 100%, resolute control over. Nothing, nothing, nothing happens by chance. Even Timothy, according to church tradition, was born in 17 AD. He meets Paul for the first time during the Apostles' second missionary journey in AD 50. At the age of 33, Timothy becomes Paul's friend, uh, traveling companion, his closest friend, in fact, and most trusted fellow laborer in the gospel. Jacob, at the age of 130, in 1670 BC, he moves his entire family to Egypt to escape a famine in Canaan. Other than himself, of the 66 people that migrated to Egypt, 33 of them were related to his first wife, Leah. Christ came through Leah's genealogy. She produced six of Jacob's 12 sons, the names of which in order were Reuben, uh, that was Jacob's firstborn, uh, Simon, Levi, Judah, uh, Issachar, and Zebulun. Now, you're, I'm sure you're, you remember God's law required a male baby be circumcised on the eighth day. Well, a woman who gave birth to a boy was also required for 33 days afterwards for a total of 40 days not to touch anything holy or come into the temple. The temple. All right. And 33 nations, not 32, not 34, not 50, 33 nations voted in favor of the UN Resolution 181 to partition Palestine. Okay? I find this interesting. You may not. I think one of the reasons why I find it so interesting is because I am steadfast on God's sovereignty. Steadfast. The Hebrew word lot, Strong's 3876, is found 33 times, okay, in three books, all right? The word means a lot. It's the name for Lot. Okay, Lot, who uh, through his father was related to Abraham, who was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction by two angels. So we see judgment in it. We see judgment in that. We see Christ himself, his lineage, King David, uh, the second coming of Christ. That number 33 has prophetic end times written all over it 
in my opinion, and I don't ask anyone to agree, you have to search these things out for yourself. Now, Jesus' death may have been at the age of 33. Many think it was. I'm not so sure, as many of you know, but His sacrifice was the fulfillment of countless prophecies, countless promises. A very old uh, Jewish tradition recounted by the first century A.D. historian Josephus states that Adam and Eve produced 33 sons and 23 daughters. Now, you may think that this is all nonsense. And that's your right. I do not, not given the times we're living. Look, I love you all, I truly do. Just something for you to think about. Join us on Sunday as we study through Galatians. I'll be inside, I won't be sweating as much. Love you all. Rest in Him. Until next time, thanks for watching.